Okay, episode number two. In this go around, it's not gonna be two hours long. Watch, it'll end up two hours long, and that's how my intro will go. <laughs> so, okay, right off the bat, I gotta tell you, I'm not a doctor. I'm not here to replace the medical advice of your physician. If you're sick, get your ass to a doctor. Um, these are things that I would do. And a lot of this is, uh, this go around is pretty um, female orientated and I'm, I'm enjoying that. Um, so, my name is April. Probably should have done this before I said all that. Um, I run at She's of the Woods on Instagram and I am the owner of Wildwood Apothecary on Itzy. You can find all those links in my bio. Um, and I'm here to ask answer <laughs> your questions that you ask me. Um, you'll see me looking at this book a lot. Um, that's because I have a crap memory when it comes to getting stuff out verbally. So I take notes because we're human and you know, well we're human. <laughs> Anyhow, so the first thing we're going to jump right into is if I was a woman who had taken birth control from the age of 17 to 32, I would be needing some serious healing because I would not have had a period, a real period in my entire adult life. So basically from uh, when you hit, word escape me, I'm so tired <laughs> and it's cold in here. When you hit puberty, there it is, <laughs> you stopped your puberty to an extent. And you took it all the way until you've come into your menopausal years. Now, take a breath. We all begin to start menopause in our late 20s, early 30s. That doesn't mean you're having hot flashes. It doesn't mean that you can't have babies. That means that your body is starting to change. People have this idea that menopause starts suddenly when you're like 50 or 40 and it. That's just it. But really, every cycle, there was a little more change and a little more change. And really, when you get to the point that you're, you're going through hot flashes and your periods stop and you, you, know, you don't bleed anymore, um, you're kind of coming to the end of menopause if you want to look at it that way. But it's okay. So really painful cramps and really heavy menstruation are going to be the name of the game for a while. Um, first of all, you don't know what your normal cycle would have been like. So this could have at some point been normal for you. But there are things to be done that can help. So if I was going through this, you'll see me struggle with remembering to say that type of stuff. Um, I would absolutely get on top of your herbal infusions. And it would definitely be the raspberry. Raspberry is going to tone your uterus and um, in regards to being able to have children in the next few years, that's going to be key. You really need to work on building the, the toning and, and just the health of your uterus back up and just kind of help clear out years of no lining sloughing off correctly. Um, and so raspberry infusion and then definitely red clover. That is going to get you kind of, you can't really balance hormones. If they were balanced, we die. They need to be where they're at. But it's going to get things kind of more in the ballpark for you. Um, and there is a video of how to do an infusion and you will find the link of the link for that under this video as well as any other thing I reference like a book you should check out uh, or you know herbs anything like that is going to be under in the comments description section um, so I'm jumping all over the place here I would also really think about adding a comfrey infusion because that's going to help repair your mucus lining and, and, and your mucus, mucus membrane linings and that is part of your vagina, uh, your uterus, everything. Um, plus you really need uh, that calcium and magnesium really helps knock those cramps out and uh, comfrey is high in both of those. Um, 
then I would really look into um, increasing your um, bioflavonoids and don't take pills to do that it, it, any pills really I'm against even herbal pills get them from the full plant medicine from the food you eat they're more readily accessible and you're not just flushing them down the toilet when you take a shit most of the vitamins and supplements people take don't even digest um, and they're full of all kinds of horrible fillers so with that aside you could also add a hawthorn berry tea hawthorn berry infusion hawthorn berry jam jelly whatever you want to make that's an excellent source of bioflavin bioflavonoids <laughs> and um, it's super good for your heart and, and just healing in general too like emotional heart health type stuff um, but then there's also strawberries, grapes, blackberries, anything and everything, citrus, apples, peaches, plums, things like that. Um, now, if you start dealing with water retention, um, I would definitely add in nettle. Uh, all these infusions are also going to build optimum health, which is going to, in turn, give your body the ability to handle such cramps and, and, and bleeding. I don't actually know if you're bleeding heavy, but usually cramps are associated with heavy bleeding. Um, that raspberry will also uh, thin your cervix, which can open a little bit more for those blood clots and stuff to come out, which is part of the reason we cramp. Um, so with these infusions, because I know that it seems overwhelming, but it just hot water, added the herbs, and, and it's a long brewed tea basically. Uh, you don't want to drink them all at the same time and you don't want to put all these herbs in the same jar and be like, oh I'm doing great, because you, if you had a reaction to something, and these are very safe, simple herbs, you wouldn't know which one it was, so don't do that. Like, you could do raspberry infusion, a cup a day for four days, and, you could, and then you would switch over to the red clover, and uh, that one both of the raspberry and the red clover would be ideal, uh, like I would start before my cycle started, like four or five days, maybe three or four, I would start with the raspberry. And then once I started bleeding, I would move into the red clover. And that's going to help with your cramps, but the thing that the red clover also does, and why you don't really want to take that infusion for more than four or five days, is because it's a blood thinner. Uh, it's not scary, you just, you know, it's going to help your blood thin, much like an ibuprofen would, except for it's not going to kill your kidneys and stuff. Um, so what I was saying before I drifted on to that is that you can make a cycle, like four days I drink this infusion, and then the next four days I do this one, and then this one until you come back to the beginning. And you could probably sit down and work with a calendar and figure out um, just how to make that cycle to where they end start and end on your on your period you know um then for like pain relief from the cramps internally um i would definitely get yourself a motherwort tincture make sure they use fresh motherwort when they did it uh motherwort tea capsules that crap is not going to work it's going to taste horrible motherwort is a bitter mint and so usually i put the dosage and a little bit of juice and take it and I would take five to ten drops every 10 to 15 minutes until the pain subsides she's great at calming us down at um, healing our nerves at taking away pain and it's safe to take during the day it's not going to intoxicate you it's just going to take you back down to a calmer level um, then I would always suggest this uh, increasing your plain yogurt intake not flavored yogurt, not slightly sweetened plain yogurt. I have found that the whole fat yogurt, which you need the animal fats anyways, <laughs> while you have having deja vu from watching my last video, it, it tastes better with the whole um, fat. You can add honey and fruit to it, just don't get the stuff that's made with sugar. You just want to stay away from that. And then up your animal fat. Uh, your body really needs protein and healthy fats while it's stripping itself. You know, you are losing not a ton of blood, but there's blood and, and just your body is just working hard to clean out your womb and it just really needs some help. Um, less sugar and less fake salt. People say salt is salt, but it's not. The sodium crap that's added to all the processed food we eat is anything but uh, nourishing for your body. You can eat real salt, 
uh, non-bleached sea salt. Any salt that's white, for the most part, has been bleached and had all kinds of anti-caking stuff. So it might say, it might say kosher or whatever, but it's still bleached. Um, then you asked about um, your liver and, and, and detoxing these chemicals out of your body. This is a pretty big thing that I need people to hear. Um, the liver cannot be detoxed. Your liver, it's not, it doesn't really filter your blood, it restores it. And detoxing your liver is damaging and can kill you. Uh, now you didn't actually ask about detoxing. I'm just bringing that up because I have a lot of people talk about that and say, oh, I'm gonna detox my liver. I'm like, you're gonna hurt yourself. So instead of trying to clean your liver, which you can't do, uh, nourish it. And you can do that by drinking um, roasted dandelion root tea as many times a day as you want. It's a tonifying herb. It's great for your kidneys too. Uh, it just helps them, it gives them a hand. It boosts them. It doesn't clean them. It helps them function higher without stressing them. Because here's the neat thing about your liver. Every 40 days, every single cell in your liver has been replaced. Fact. So, if for the next 40 days and beyond, you start drinking these nourishing herbal infusions, you start helping um, your kidney and your liver with dandelion infusions, uh, well, tea, uh, you could do infusion too, but I mean the roasted root tastes good with creamer, it's like coffee. Um, you'll have a brand new healthy liver. And, and even if there's been damage done, you just keep doing this and keep doing this and it just keeps repairing and keeps repairing. Um, up your water intake. Um, and don't worry about it causing bloating. Some women, uh, our water retention will stay away, but the nettle will help get rid of that. So will healthy salts. Um, and then yellow dock root tincture uh, is pretty helpful for cramping and heavy flooding or just regulating um, our cycle. And that's great because it's just great. <laughs> it's great because it's also a tonic for your, it's a tonifying herb for your liver as well. Um, and it really just kind of helps get that blood clean. I don't like to use that word, but it is kind of what it is. Um, so I'm pretty sure that if you work with these things and you give them time, time is key. People hop onto herbs and they say one cycle in or, or one month on, oh, well this didn't help, what else can I find? Don't do that. These aren't pharmaceutical medications, although they are just as strong, you know, herbs are medicine, so they need to be taken with um, precaution. But uh, it takes time for your body to slowly heal itself. Um, this isn't Western medicine where it gives you an instant gratification feeling of change, you know. Um, and then the one last thing, um, asked about my thoughts on milk thistle for um, the liver. Milk thistle is great, but it is a protectant herb. I <laughs> can get that out right. Like, milk thistle is like a before you go drinking type thing. Like it protects versus repairs. So if you use some milk thistle tincture before you decide that you're gonna go out and get shit based, cause I mean, we're human and we do that every now and then, your liver will be happier than if, if you take it before than after. Um, so while it won't hurt anything, it's kind of just like a unnecessary thing to do for after, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, this one, hold on, I gotta get drink something. I'm still nervous, even though I already did one video and everyone's like, oh, we loved it. <laughs> um, if I was a person dealing with hormonal problems, I would need to know how old I was to answer this question better. But I, oh, dang, I forgot to mention for something for the last one I looked down and I remembered. So wait, this all kind of plays into it, so it wasn't a total like <laughs> memory loss. So I talked about menopause and I, and I want the person that I'm talking to here to listen to this too. 
This is Susan Weed's book, New Menopausal Years for the Wise Woman Way. It's going to talk to you about menopause, and I don't want you to think I'm not, I'm, you know, too young for that. Get this book anyways. Be prepared. I mean, uh, this you're having issues with your cycle uh, being delayed, no sex drive, um, acne issues. There could be a lot of reasoning, and, and it didn't, the question didn't go into depth, but I would really, really suggest getting this book. And I'm not getting paid to tell you that. Um, <laughs> also, if you go onto Amazon and you find the book, and I'll put a link under you know the video, um, and you look at the used section of books, you can get this basically for the cost of shipping. Uh, because don't feel bad about not supporting the amazing author, Susan Weed, because most sales through Amazon almost barely support anybody who sells a book. So if you really want to support her um, and not save uh, some money, you can actually go to, I think it's Ashtree Publishing, and buy a book from there. And then this is the thing, the main thing that I forgot uh, um, for the first gal, um, thinking about kids. Childbearing Year from Susan S. Weed. This is going to guide you um, early and safely all the way through trying, g getting ready to even try to become pregnant, getting pregnant, going through the pregnancy, and then aftercare. And it's an easy read and it, it's pretty affordable. Uh, and I'll link that down. It's called Childbearing Year from Susan Weed. So, now that I got what I forgot out there, um, so. Without knowing your age, I would just guess that you're probably in your mid to late 20s, or you could be in your 30s or beyond. I would start getting ready to accept the fact that my body is changing. That doesn't mean we can't do things about it. Right, it's cold in here. Last time I had tank top on, but it's like warmed up to 59, which I'm happy about. It was like negative 13 Fahrenheit this morning, so my stove just can't keep up. Anyhow. If you have a cycle, if your period is off, you know, like you just you bleed really heavy for a month or you're a few days late, which that's actually pretty common as we cycle with the moon. Um, if you're a few days late, if you cramped heavier, anything like that that happens just for one cycle, it just happens. Your body just said, this is how it's going to be. Not to say that there aren't <laughs> underlying things that are causing it. But if you start having repeatedly late periods, and not just like a few days late, and not predictably late, and if you pay attention to your cycle with the full moon calendar, those are easy, you can Google 2017 full moon calendar, print it off, and start circling when you bleed, and if you do that for a year, you can actually start to watch as you cycle with the moon, especially if you're not on birth control, because, you know, you have to be having a real period for it to work. But anyhow, um, if your periods are off, erratic, and it's doing this for more than two or three periods at a time, you are going through menopause. Once again, that's not hot flash, never have more babies, anything like that menopause, but it is menopause. Uh, and I, at 31, am going through it. Now, I used to bleed heavy through my entire period. Um, before that, I bled light. But now, I bleed like the first two days, and I, and I help myself a lot, and I'm gentle with myself, and I allow myself to rest as much as I can. Um, but like, I bleed almost to death the first two days, like I feel like I could die. Um, and then after that, it's like another four days of like, forgetting that I'm on my period. And it's been like that for like, you know, I think a year now, so that is just, part of my body and now of course I'm helping myself and, and uh, nourishing myself as I go through this change but I, I mean and like I said I could still have a baby right now if I felt crazy enough to do so I got two and they're pre-teens and pre-teens so I'm good <laughs> um, so as far as sex drive goes uh, lack of libido you can really start doing oat straw. You know, the whole like, sow your oats, eat your oats, that's that's legit. If you start making oat straw infusions, um, which there'll be a link, to, um, me showing you how to make herbal infusions and a link about why infusions are good um, to read about and watch more of. Um, 
you'll see it's pretty easy to do. But oat straw is great. It gets things flowing, moving, energy built. It restores moisture. I'm guessing that if your libido is low, you're also not very wet. I mean, this is things that happen to us. <laughs> uh, and then I would get on the comfrey infusion as well. It's going to help repair and re-elasticize and moisten uh, your membrane down there. Um, and then you heard me talk about the red clover, um, the red raspberry, and the nettle infusion. I would get on top of that too. Um, you know, it's just going to help you through this. Um, the red clover takes, tastes great with a little bit of cream. So does the raspberry nettle. Drink it cold, warm, tends to make people feel pukey because it's got so much energy in it. It can absolutely replace your coffee. It's real energy. You won't crash. It supports your uh, adrenaline, everything, uh, your adrenals. <laughs> um, and then eat plain yogurt. Every woman should be eating plain yogurt. I don't care who you are. You don't even have to agree with me, but I mean... You eat a cup or more a day of plain yogurt, and you're going to start seeing changes. You're going to, first of all, it helps your gut heal, um, but it starts to moisten things down there. It just, it's helpful. You need it. <laughs> Don't forget about what's between your legs it is affected by what you put in your mouth. People just, the disconnect, you know? Um, and then check out the menopause book, because my notes said to say that. <laughs> um, so... I kind of hope a bit of that was helpful. I feel like I'm rushing, like I'm anxiety talking a bit here. So sorry if I am, but I'm still getting the stuff out. All right, moving forward. So I talked like a ton about bone broth, or I mentioned it a lot um, with the last one. You know what's funny is I feel like I need to like, Get a pair of like googly eyes to put on the camera up here to make eye contact with. Cause I just look at like this one. <laughs> I look at the camera lens and I'm like, I just have a hard time making eye contact with the camera. <laughs> Anyhow, so I talked about bone broth a lot. Um, if I don't get that, if I didn't get that out of my head, it was just gonna rattle around there and distract me. So bone broth, right? I think I had brought that up. Uh, they asked about like making bone broth. And I know you can go crazy reading people's blogs and opinions, and of course this is just my opinion. It's no different than any other opinion you read. I won't cook bone broth for less than 48 hours. Anything under that you're just making stock. Um, the idea behind bone broth is that as you cook these bones down, um, Sorry, I gotta drink the water. Um, the nutrients from the bone itself, well, mainly the marrow inside of the bone, is leaching out of the bone and into the broth, and all the healthy fats and stuff that go along with that. So, a day of boiling just isn't enough. I personally do three days. I do two days with the lid on, people. You need that liquid in there long enough to actually cook without it drying out your pot. And then the third day, I boil it all day long with the lid off. And I usually let it reduce. So, like, I just made, um, some of you on my Instagram stories might have seen that I had just made a bunch of bone broth. Well, the third day, I, you know, I had 21 quarts of water, of, well, of broth at that point, a lot. And then I let it boil all the way down to 10. So half, you want to reduce it. And that kind of, like, uh, it, well, it, it just, it's stronger. I can't use the right words apparently today. <laughs> um, but it's stronger. Um, all those nutrients and everything are cooked down and in there for you. Um, and then they asked about freezing and nutrient loss. I personally don't think you lose any more um, nutrients than if... Like, okay, so when you go and get canned vegetables from the store, the reason that they're not as nutritious, besides the fact that they're in metal and all that, all that BPA stuff aside, um, they sit forever. Um, and then when you get flash frozen vegetables, they go from the field to the freezer. And so they keep their nutrients. And so it's kind of the same thing with bone broth. I don't really feel like it affects the nutrient loss. Uh, and it's minimal. I mean, what are you gonna do? You gotta store it in some way. 
And I, I personally pressure can my bra. You have to know how to do that. People are really intimidated with canning. Um, it, you have to use a pressure cooker. You cannot use a water bath with low acid foods. Do not kill yourself with botulism. Um, but I like, I prefer pressure canning, and I would say that that probably holds the nutrients better. But listen, the little bit you lose when you freeze it is you're still going to be getting more than if you didn't make it. You know, um, I think people worry about that type of stuff too much. Not you, just people in general. Um, and then I think they asked about boxed broth from the store. Listen, I cook with boxed broth. If I'm making like rice or, you know, just a quick soup. Yeah. And you know, and I get the stuff that has no MSG, no chemicals in it. But no matter what kind of broth you buy from the store in a box and a can, it is just water with concentrated flavor added. So, I mean, it's good if you have the flu, I guess, and you don't have bone broth on hand, because at least there's some salts in there that you can replace in your body. But it's not really doing you any good besides flavor, you know. Uh, and now I'm sure you could probably find some like uber organic $8 carton broth that's real. But at that point you might as well just buy the stuff to make bone broth. Um, oh, and then if you have the ability to do it, don't hurt yourself trying. Um, you know, we hunt a lot, so I've got all the knives and stuff to, big knives, a butcher knife. Crack the bones open before you put them in there. That's going to let even more nutrients out than boiling it for three days. And you still want to do it for a long time, at least two days, but then you get all that marrow out really quickly. Marrow is really good. Um, and then they asked about uh, where do we start a healthy lifestyle? And I know that shit can be intimidating. And um, I think that it's made more complicated by people who like to make you feel bad about not living as healthy as I think you should. And of course we could all be a little healthier, but one day at a time. <laughs> so start off with nourishing herbal infusions. That's a pretty thing, easy thing to do. And um, you can really start by just feeling better. And then um, as far as the food, I know that that's hard because as a society we're addicted to things that are easy. We're tired from working, from kids, from school, from just life being fucking hard. <laughs> so it's easy to just open a can of something or dump out a box or microwave something. Um, and then I think people get discouraged because they say, I'm going to be healthy and I'm going to get all this shit out of my house and then I'm going to eat this and then they're like, oh my god, I feel like shit because to an extent we tell ourselves that, oh, I shouldn't eat that because it's not healthy. And then we don't really nourish ourselves truly with healthy food. And then we don't eat it all. And in a lot of ways, it's more unhealthy not to eat that damn cheeseburger than, it, it, than to go hungry. You know, um, and I, I kind of talked about that a little bit in the other one. So instead of going all crazy and trying to get everything out and being overwhelmed, eliminate one, just one bad food habit a month. Say... I'm not going to buy that box of cookies, I'm going to make my own. <laughs> and now you're like, oh, but you're still eating cookies, but what if you could recognize all the ingredients in your cookies? Plus, you're not going to eat cookies as often because you're tired and baking real cookies from scratch and cookies out of a box that you buy from the store that you add water and oil to are not from scratch. I mean, open up a recipe, start sifting flour and shit. You will enjoy those cookies, they'll taste better, and you're not going to eat them as often. Uh, just to be clear, this person didn't tell me they had a cookie problem. <laughs> That's just kind of where my mind went. But you could do that with, you know, any unhealthy food that you find yourself eating that you know is not healthy. You can start making it yourself or just cutting it out of your diet and trying to replace it with something else. But ideally, I think that I would start, and I did start, well, let's see, I kind of started with herbal infusions, just long brewed tea, so there's a link under this video to watch how to make herbal infusions, um, even though I'm not making that video until after this one is done, but that's like time travel shit, there will be a link, <laughs> um, okay, I think I'm making good time here, okay,
let's jump into some deeper stuff, deeper water. So after I do a drink of some water or tea, which one is it? Okay. If I was about to give birth and thinking about consuming my placenta, I would think about it deeply. How do we prepare this? Holy shit, there's so much information on the internet. And once again, this is what I would do. My opinion is no more valid than anybody else's. Um, the thing about any meat, let's be honest here, your placenta is meat. It's an organ meat. Is that if you don't eat it basically raw or or cooked for a very long time, just like any meat, uh, you're not going to be able to digest your cell membranes. I'm talking on a cellular level. Um, so, you either got to eat it raw or cook it a long time. And I don't suggest eating it raw. Um, so, I would make, and I might have slowed down there a second, I probably just had an adrenaline crash. <laughs> I would cook this for a really long time. I would make a stew. I would make a thick root stew. That's me though. You can make any type of soup you want. Shit, you could make bone broth. Do not make yourself sick by consuming too much. Placenta is powerful energy. And you start eating too much of it, but it's going to really, really make you feel like shit. Like jittery, you know, like you're ODing on caffeine or, you know, those energy pills we used to be able to get at the truck stop, you know? <laughs> uh, might be from Eastern Oregon if. But, uh, and then I would freeze, so I would freeze it. I would make this stew, because this is the quickest way for you to have it after birth. And I'm going to talk about what you should do, or what I would do with the rest of it. Uh, so you're going to make a pot of stew, or whatever you want. And, like, go find yourself some little containers. Little containers, and package it all up, and freeze it. That way you're not like, oh, this is really good, because it could taste good, you know? And you eat this big ass bowl, and then you're like having a fucking anxiety attack because you got too much energy. Um, and I wouldn't add a lot. I would add like, I don't know, like a fourth of the placenta to the entire batch of stew. With the rest of that, I would not encapsulate. I don't trust stuff in capsules, even if you make it yourself, even if your doula, your midwife makes it for you. Uh, that's such a Western thing we do. Put herbs in cap capsules, this and pills, 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 and you end up taking one, taking two, or, you know, kind of, I don't know, it, it has an expiration date that way, and it just, you're not really seeing the amount you're taking, and uh, you can kind of dig into how, um, where Susan Weed talks about the dangers of capsules, and I stand with her pretty firmly on that, and, uh, and even with placenta, and definitely, a lot of doulas and stuff will add herbs to it, and that's just, okay, that rant aside, I would tincture the rest. I would absolutely tincture the rest. And the reason that I would have you do both is because a tincture, you're gonna let that shit go for like eight to 12 weeks before you decant it, which is fancy word for dump it out through a strainer, keep the liquid, and go bury the rest um, somewhere special to you. Because, we just shouldn't throw stuff like that or any herbs we use in the garbage. Um, so then with a the tincture, remember to use really small amounts. And plus a tincture lasts forever. And you're going to want to use 100 proof vodka. Not 80 proof, not 170 proof or whatever, 100 proof. That way the vodka, the alcohol you're using is 50% water, 50% alcohol because that's the way 100 proof rolls. It's never 100 proof alcohol, it's 50-50. And then you don't have to worry with stupid doses. I don't know why people do that. It just makes... Maybe they like doing math. I don't know. But then you have this tincture that can last as long as you have it. It'll never go bad. Um, but remember, too much will make you jittery. Plain and simple. Uh, and so go slow. It is better to take too little and not feel the effect right away than take too much 
and just fucking regret that decision. <laughs> uh, so, uh, another thing is, is that if you haven't done this before, and probably even do a lot of research, but I'm just going to put this out there for other people who are listening. Um, the hospital has to have direct permission to release your medical waste to you. So you need to talk to your doctor about that and have a form filled out with orders to give you your placenta. Then you also need to be strict that you don't want them to wash it and you don't want them to add preservatives because that's a thing that's been happening in the past few years is that they're like, okay, we'll give you your placenta, but for liability reasons, they like wash it and then like douse it in some fucking preservative. Or if they really don't believe you, they just, you know, nothing personal here, but here we have Catholic hospitals and they really, really, really are against and here anyhow, uh, midwives or anything like that. So sometimes they'll give it to you in a jar full of preservatives. Like you just want to like look at it like a specimen jar. So be specific. Bring an ice chest with ice in it. Oh, hush, hush, you're fine. Bring an ice chest with ice in it or get ice from the hospital to put it in there as, as soon as you get it. And now of course you want to wash it yourself. I just wouldn't personally trust the hospital to do that. Um, so, I hope that that gave a little bit of help. Alright. I don't know which I like better. Cutting in between the videos or... Because I feel like when I cut in between the videos, I have time to like... Take a breath and like come into the next question more centered. I don't know. Maybe bringing that up was enough for me to calm down and see who is messaging me. <laughs> I have to. I have to. I still have life going on out here. Um, nothing crucial. <laughs> okay, so I talked about perioral, perioral, man, I thought I was going to nail that word that time. I did. Perioral dermatitis. <laughs> um, a lot in depth uh, in the last go around, but a gal got a hold of me because she has an 18 month old child that's dealing with this. And if I was in that situation, um, and I had, at that time, an herbal salve that made it go away. My mind is like, what was in the salve? What herbs were in that salve that really helped to heal it, you know? Um, and, and I know that you might not have the container still, but if you can remember even just one thing that was in there, could kind of dig in from there. And if you want to send me a message, if you remember just even one of the herbs, um, I can send you some links to where you can read more about it. Um, it's tricky with a babe because you can't do all the adult things, you know. But if this was my little and I was going through this, I know that the chlorine is out of the drinking water. But I really want you to get a filter for, I would, I would put a filter in my bathroom. And even if, I, if, if the babe could only take a shower, I know they like a bath more, but um, they have these little inserts made by Berkey, and I'm going to put a link under here for them, and they're only $40. I know $40 isn't a tiny amount, but um, it's worth getting that chlorine off of you, because even if we're not drinking it, our skin is our skin is the biggest organ, and we are taking that stuff in. Um, so that aside, I would also make some plantain oil, um, and not the banana. <laughs> the weed, um, duck foot, white man's foot, plantain, um, and they're so easy to make. Uh, you could buy dried plantain, it wouldn't be as strong. If you live somewhere where there isn't snow on the ground, plantain is green year round. Make sure you're not somewhere where they spray your dogs go to the bathroom to find it. It's really, really easy to ID, but Make sure you ID from three individual sources that are not like vague blogs. Make sure they have like scientific resources and things like that. Um, so basically you take your dried plant matter. I usually like to let it sit out for a day after I chop it off to let a little bit of the moisture say dried plant matter before that. So you're going to take your wet plant matter, chop it up, let it sit out to dry for a day or so. Just a, probably just a day. Let some of that moisture get off of it, put it in your jar, cover it with oil, sit it somewhere dark, please don't sit it in the sun, don't do that with any herbs please, <laughs> anyhow, uh, sit it somewhere 
dark and cold and let it sit for six weeks like to the dot like make an alarm on your phone you let it sit too long when there's wet plant matter in there and it'll start to move um, strain it and put it right back where you were storing it you can rub that right on the issue and I would use um, as far as what type of oil to use I would use avocado oil it's spendy but it's got great essential fatty acids. Of course, check for allergies, you know, do a skin test to make sure. Uh, but that's what I would do. Um, and then I would also up their real fermented foods. Like, you know, I know getting kids to eat plain yogurt is hard, but you can make it into a smoothie. Um, you know, things like that. Anyway, my mind escapes me for all the ways that I thought that you could get a kid to eat it. I had like a bunch and I should have written them down, <laughs> written them down. Um, but you could get like um, some fermented food. Uh, stay away from like kombucha and water keeper. Now I like those, but they don't actually have a very high load of um, healthy gut flora. They're more of a, I mean they do, just Google it. <laughs> I could maybe put a link down there as to why like it, the stuff in the store, they add probiotics to it, plain and simple. Uh, so like you can get like Bubby's Pickles or any type of brand like you know I don't know if you can get the kid to eat kimchi or like you could even just start fermenting your own food. Of course go really slowly with it. Um, this doesn't apply to yogurt but to real fermented food if you start eating a lot all the time you're gonna get what's known as die off or bad bacteria and your gut starts to die and you're gonna feel like you're dying. You're going to have the flu, aches and cramps and shit. And so you just, you know, like a pickle a day <laughs> isn't going to cause that. And a real fermented pickle, not a vinegar made pickle. Um, so I, I just mean like I would focus really heavily on gut health. I mean that's pretty connected to our skin and stuff. Um, and then, you know, uh, your little has been drinking infusions with you. If it was my child and I felt comfortable after I did all the appropriate research, <laughs> I would start sharing comfrey infusions. And if you do have a way to filter your bath uh, water, not just your shower, or fill your bath up, you know, with the shower, I know it takes a while, but it, it can be done. Uh, you could add some comfrey infusion to the bath. It gets on their skin, you know. Um, but that plantain oil I talked about would really help with going out in the cold and it getting dry and stuff. Um, and the avocado oil absorbs really readily, so it's not going to lock moisture in, making it more angry, you know? Um, and you might consider putting it on in the evenings before bed because they're not touching your face as much and wiping it off. Okay, so... On to the last one. I'm pretty sure this hasn't been a two hour video. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> the last one I was like, oh, I'll edit it down and it won't be as long. And you know, things are just taking long, so it's doing stuff in between making the videos. And I was like, shit, this is still a two hour long video. <laughs> so, I'm probably not gonna say this right. Lichen sclerosis um, is something pretty specific to women. And sometimes doctors tell us we have this when they don't know what else to tell us. Um, it's basically where the tissue around your vulva and over your clitoris like tightens and gets dried out. Not for everybody. You can get sores. Um, it's not a contagious disease. This is just your body screaming to you that something is upsetting you. I know that people are like, oh, that stuff doesn't really apply. But it does. Um, it's trying to get comfortable. In this chair, I don't have an ass, so this chair is just killing me. Um, <laughs> um, When we are super stressed out, and now wait a minute, this can happen without any reason, but let me just approach the people that might have this happening for a reason that they haven't thought of. When we are super stressed out, it tends to 
come out in our vaginas. When I get really, really stressed, I'll get a cyst. I'll get a bar full of a cyst. I'll get an infection, and I know it's because I am not taking care of myself. That does not put blame anywhere at all. It doesn't mean that you caused this and you should feel bad about it. It means that society has made us go so fucking fast all the time and care more about things going on around us than what's going on inside of us. And we just get conditioned to take care of everybody else instead of ourselves. And even if you're not, I don't mean like you're a healer, you could be, but I mean like, are you more worried about your family, about paying bills, and all this stuff clearly has to still happen, but we get in this perpetual cycle of no self-care, no downtime, just pushing a little harder, just going a little harder, you know, and then we can suffer for it. So, if I was told at a very young age, in my 20s, that I had this going on, right off the bat, um, I would jump into comfrey infusions. It's really good. It's healing. It's going to repair elasticity. Elasticity? <laughs> I can't say that word, but you, it's going to make things stretchy again. There you go. <laughs> uh, I would also do a sitz bath, which is where you boil up a big pot of it, you strain out the plant material, and you put your ass in the pot, or a big bowl, or in your bathtub. And you know, make sure you don't burn yourself, make sure it's cooled down. And I would sit there until it goes cool. And I would do that once a day isn't gonna hurt you. And you also could do that with oat straw as well as infusions. Now, I want you to drink infusions separately from themselves. But the sits bath, it's okay to do them both at the same time. You're not really drinking that internally. Um, Oat straw is really good. Uh, I talked earlier about how that gets your juices flowing. Um, I have a suspicion, and I could be completely wrong, that you might be kind of drier than you realize. Um, and so with you, if I was you, I would eat three cups of plain yogurt a day, religiously. Make it your breakfast, make it your lunch, make it a snack, I don't care, get it into your body. Um, then I would really jump onto the red clover, but I would not do that for more than three or four days a week because it is a blood thinner and you don't want to bleed out if you cut yourself from drinking. I mean, it's not that, it's not like heparin or anything. It's not like this, you know, but if you drink it like constantly, like all the time, there would be an issue. So cycle through the comfrey and the oat straw into the red clover. And you might as well add nettle in there because your body needs optimum nutrition and uh, nettle is one of the highest nutrient pack, packed herbals, foods there is. It even surpasses blue green algae. Um, get soy out of your life. Those are bad photoestrogens. They're long estrogens. They're cancer causing. They're irritating. They're drying. They're horrible for us as women. Um, but you can get good photoestrogens, which will help your body regulate itself by the red clover infusion. Anything roots, like food-wise, root vegetables, you know, sweet potatoes, yams, uh, there is a difference. Yams are not sweet potatoes, and sweet potatoes aren't yams. <laughs> uh, carrots, turnips, radishes, anything that grows under the ground, even though a potato is a tuber, that still counts, eat it. Uh, seeds and nuts, peanuts are not a nut, they don't count, they're a legume. <laughs> um, whole grains beans, flax seed is great, but not the oil, it tends to go rancid. Um, and then um, get all that in your diet will help. And then um, for like externally, for putting something down there to help maybe stop the pain or dryness, it's different for every woman. And it's, that's why it's kind of like a broad diagnosis. Um, I would do chickweed oil. That restores lubrication and flexibility. Um, to your vag vaginal walls uh, and you could also do plantain especially if you have itching sometimes itching like a stinging itching comes along with it much like it's vulval dystrophy not the same thing i didn't tell you it has something different it's like it i just want to <laughs> make sure that i didn't scare you with a new word where it can kind of itch and burn and the plantain is good for that um, and you can go back to where i talked about how to make uh, an oil uh, and chickweed 
grow so much anywhere. It does go dormant in the winter, but if you don't have a bunch of snow on the ground, you could probably find some. It's pretty easy to ID, but make sure that you ID it from three different sources. And if you did buy dried chickweed, you could make the infusion that way. Um, I'll put a link under where it's safe to buy herbs from, and I'm not affiliated with them or anything. Um, it would just need to sit longer to make that oil. Um, so, be gentle with yourself. Allow yourself to accept the fact that you didn't do anything wrong and you're going through this and you're young and while we should always approach doctors if we have medical concerns, they can be wrong. Uh, I mean, they can be so wrong at times that doctors might be the third largest cause of death in the United States. <laughs> um, and I will put a link to that in the bottom too. It's just, I'm not talking on my ass. Like medical malpractice is like the third leading cause of death in America. No joke. But whatever your doctor's doing for you, I'm not saying to not see your doctor and they're probably not going to kill you. I'm just saying that you can prove a doctor wrong and you can reverse what they call an extremely rare syndrome that, you know, that is uncurable. Well, you know, their way isn't the only way. Um, and then a tricky part about this is sometimes we have a lot of like repressed sexual things going on. Once again, you didn't tell me that you had this issue. I'm not assuming I just mean in a broad term. Sometimes from damage from past relationships or molestation or rape or internalized guilt, uh, we don't deal with that. And then we're holding on to all this stuff and our body just shuts down. Our, our vagina just shuts down and doesn't want any type of touch that isn't gentle from yourself. So I would personally, I would sustain from sex from any, with anybody besides myself and I would give myself more orgasms. <laughs> They're healing and I know that some people can't have an orgasm. It took me years to give myself an orgasm. Um, but that act in itself is healing. Working through any trauma even, it doesn't have to be sexual trauma that prevents orgasm and causes things to go awry down there. Um, you learn your body more, and I mean, they really are healing. And if you do have to have, no, you should never have to have sex with somebody. That's rape. <laughs> if you have to do it, or else, that's rape. But I mean, if your partner isn't completely understanding and you're not able to say, well, too bad, I'm trying to heal my body. Um, make sure you give yourself an orgasm before you allow them to injure you. Uh, you'll be more receptive, there won't be as much tissue damage. Come on, ladies. What's it like? I mean, like, we've all done that. We've all had sex with somebody when we weren't really in the mood and, you know, you, you're going to have to use the, you just, it's not, you're like, <laughs> it's not that great and it and you know that you're not as wet as you could be um, or you have to use a bunch of lubrication and it just does damage and um, I'm sorry if that made some of you uncomfortable but I mean it's a common fact of life and women deserve to have orgasms too and we need them we need them um, I mean it could just like melt the stress out of your body and let everything relax so I really hope um, that some of that helps some of you and that you feel comfortable asking me these questions and I know that those of you that are first watching this video or are now diving in um, might have more questions to ask me and you're going to go down to the comment section and be like I have this question and I gotta ask her and you're going to notice that I don't allow comments um, I go over why pretty heavily in episode one um, but if you have a question that comes up from any of this, or a different question, or you want to see your question covered, anything like that, go to my website, which is wildwoodapothecary.org, 
enter my website and click where it says ask an herbalist and you can read all about it and submit a question. Um, if I'm going to answer your question, you will have gotten an email telling you that I did so you don't have to be like, you know, you don't have to watch if you don't want to. Um, if I scared some of you away, that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm really grateful to be here with you guys and so far being accepted with open arms. Um, majority of you probably came from my Instagram account. If you just happen to be stumbling across me and you want to learn more about me, um, definitely find my Instagram at she is of the woods and in between each word is an underscore. You can go to my profile here and find the link to there. Um, so anyhow, I really hope that I helped some people and that my social awkwardness and quick talking didn't kind of completely ruin it for everybody. So I'd like to say that eventually I'll get over my self-consciousness. I still feel like if I get like googly eyes for my camera, it wouldn't be so like weird. Like I wish I could like show you what it, it just looks weird and I just need something to make eye contact with. So anyhow. It is still only 60 degrees in here, so I'm going to kick the rest of my fans back on and get some heat moving around. But would have left them on, you wouldn't have heard me. So, um, alright guys, well, I'll see you next time, and I hope that you feel comfortable submitting questions.